Dr. James Densley is the author of The Violence Project. It's a nonprofit that researches mass shootings, more importantly, how to prevent them by studying the warning signs that Brian was talking about of a potential mass shooter. Uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight, James. Uh, your research shows that mass shooters tend to have some things in common in terms of warning signs. Uh, tell us what you have found. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, yeah, we've looked at the life histories of mass shooters going back all the way to 1966 to the present day in this new book, The Violence Project. And we find that uh, mass shooters tend to be an identifiable crisis in the weeks and months leading up to the shooting. What we mean by a crisis is something that overwhelms your usual coping mechanisms. And so it's often observable. Uh, it's noticeable in as much that there is a marked change in behavior from somebody's baseline. It might be increased agitation. It might be a, a disconnection with reality. And it really is on us to, to notice when somebody is in a crisis. I think the important thing to remember about school shooters is that they tend to be school children. And that means they are insiders to the school. They are our kids. Uh, they are you know, walking through those doors every single day. And so we've got to be paying attention to what's going on in their lives so we can intervene in the event that they are uh, struggling. Which also means they are familiar with the school, the surroundings, the vulnerabilities in terms of security, and even the drills that students go through to prevent this type of thing. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, again, as an insider, it's not a surprise to a school shooter if they encounter a school resource officer or a locked door or a metal detector because they are walking through that every single day of their lives. Now, that doesn't mean to say that those measures don't save lives. I believe they really do. But it puts the emphasis on us to do something uh, before that and to, and to really uh, have that be the last line of defense as opposed to the only line of defense. You know, if you think about other measures that we need to be taking, it's often the case that school shooters get their firearms from their parents and from family members. And so just safe storage of a firearm, you know, simple gun lock, for example, could save lives. So we've got to get on the front end of this, because if we're waiting for the school resource officer and the locked door, then it's too late. Right. You're reacting at that point. Uh, James, there was some research that I came across today that stood out to me, and it said the majority of violent incidents in U.S. schools, someone other than the attacker knew that it was going to happen, but they failed to report it. What typically stops somebody from speaking out and saying something if they are suspicious or concerned that something may happen? It's a great question. I think people are worried about being perceived as being a snitch or overreacting. And also as well, in our society, we tend to rely heavily on a law enforcement response to any and all problems. And it's really difficult for a parent to call 911 on their own child or for somebody to, to, who doesn't trust the police to have to put things in the hands of law enforcement. So we really need alternatives in addition to a law enforcement response where people can get the type of help and support they need. One of the things we found in our research is that many school shooters are actively suicidal and they intend to die in the act. Now that might not necessarily be enough the case with the Oxford uh, shooting that we had this week, but that tells us something about how people are processing these events. If they intend it to be their final act, then a law enforcement response that's punitive, that's punishing somebody, that's gonna get them connected on that school to prison pipeline, it's probably not gonna serve the underlying grievance. It's not gonna fix the problem. We need to make sure we're connecting people to services, to resources, so that it's not just a police response to these problems because the police can't do it all. Right, and reading through some of your data today, uh, one thing struck me about school's role in terms of preparedness and readiness and, you, readiness, and you say we need to do more in terms of aftercare once these events happen, uh, really understanding as a community how we handle it to prevent the next one. What do you mean by that? Well, this, this is what's heartbreaking about this. I mean, in addition to the lives lost in these shootings, every single school shooting just utterly devastates a community. And then I think collectively as a society, we are all experiencing some uh, vicarious trauma from watching this play out time and time again. Now, the other thing we see though in the lives of mass shooters and school shooters is that they often study 
past school shootings and mass shootings. They can be inspired by those particular acts. Some of them do these things because they're fame seeking. Now, if that's the case, every single school shooting is effectively contributing to the next school shooting. So it's on us to really intervene now to do something about this so that you don't contribute to that contagion and that this violence doesn't spread any further. Taking a hard look at what we know and what we can learn from it to prevent it. Dr. James Densley with The Violence Project. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.